My name is Marshall Crosser. Uh, I've worked at uh, Industrial Light and Magic uh, in San Francisco for a little over 18 years now. Initially I was hired to work on Casper in the rotoscoping department and uh, as time went on I moved up to become a compositor and then uh, be, been a compositing supervisor for uh, at least 12 or 13 years now. And it's a really uh, exciting place to work. We get a lot of really uh, exciting projects and get to work with some very uh, unique and talented individuals. Compositing has changed a lot. When I first started uh, and I worked a little bit on Forrest Gump, there were a few compositors at that time that were doing stuff. Mainly things were done at that time by technical directors who would do the lighting and do the compositing. But at that point in time, the compositing was pretty simple because just the whole concept of getting a digital render out of the computer that looked really good was, you know, uh, the most important part. Um, as the, the industry has evolved and grown, uh, compositing has become a, you know, kind of key component of that. I kind of jokingly say it's kind of like the final cook. You, you take all of the pieces that have been done by all of the artists and technicians and you put it together to do the final composite or the final image. Uh, one thing we've been doing a lot lately is adding a, a high level of photorealism uh, on shows I work on. I, 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 you know, kind of pride myself in taking uh, note of that fact. Uh, I do a lot of photography. I was a graphic design major, so I come from a, uh, an artistic background, and so it's I've learned to develop my eye by working with uh, a lot of people. You know, Dennis Murin is one. Uh, who was one of my mentors as I went through, and Scott Farrar was another one. So uh, just finding out what they find is important and, and moving forward from that. And, and compositing, like I said, it, it's, it is a very you know, key component. Uh, you know, all, of the, all of the different disciplines are uh, critical as well. So it's just, uh, you know, for us, it's like we're kind of getting to put the icing and the sprinkles on the cake. With, you know, always uh, at any facility, you have to continue to update your pipeline and keep growing it. And, and the big, the big uh, area that we moved forward on was water simulation. Uh, we got some of what I would consider some of the best water uh, renders uh, and splashes and stuff to work with. As, you know, as opposed to a compositor, I was excited about that aspect of it. Uh, I had been the compositing supervisor on Pearl Harbor, so in ways it did kind of harken back to some of that. But now, you know, if I look back on how we did things then versus how we might do it today, I mean, we have advanced and there's been a lot of forward progression. I mean, the, the big thing is the compositing package. I mean, we now have capabilities of doing stuff in, in 3D so we can bring the camera uh, scene in uh, to our package, uh, which is Nuke, <laughs> which everybody I'm sure is using. And it allows us uh, more flexibility and faster turnaround and can get you know even a higher level of, of uh, precision uh, as far as getting things to lock into it. I mean, there again, it's critical you have a good uh, camera layout from our uh, layout artists. Simulation is is growing quite a bit uh, as far as the water and uh, also uh, like explosions and type. You know, we did work with Scanline on some shots um, on Battleship, and uh, you know we were looking at it, it's like wow, this is some really great stuff. It was very impressive. And you know their uh, their approach might be a little different than our approach. I mean that's the thing, you know, Ford, Chevy, Toyota, <laughs> Mercedes. I mean it's like all of these different uh, types and ways to to do the same type of thing. And you know I think over over time it will be interesting to see how the uh, simulation uh, evolves and continues to move forward. Some of the other you know challenges uh, with this movie is that that Peter really wanted. Uh, people to kind of be participants in the movie uh, instead of just a passive observer. So, you know, there's a lot of in your face, there's a lot of kind of handheld stuff. Uh, we did a lot of stuff uh, utilizing, you know, water hitting the lenses because actually when he shot some of the plate photography, a lot of that was happening. I mean, he didn't worry about, oh, oh the camera just got hit with some water. We let that go. He, he was, you know, had been a commercial director, so lens flares. He has no issues with that. He would shoot stuff with flares, so that allowed us the, the flexibility to add those in as well, which we used in, in one of the uh, kind of hand-to-hand -hand combat seats. We, we uh, 
where the uh, batteries are flashing and all that stuff is going on. It, it added a lot of chaos, added a lot of energy to the sequence. So, you know, that type of stuff, some people might say, oh, it's a cheat or it's a trick. It's like, well, not really if it's, if it's kind of adding to the excitement. I think it's one of those situations if you, um, when we add camera shakes and, and movements like that, uh, we had a, a case way back on the first Mission Impossible where we had uh, camera shake on a sequence and you know about halfway through the shot the camera shake just shut off and suddenly it became smooth and boring so uh, you know those type of, of, of uh, techniques are, are, are great to utilize if you do it uh, sparingly. You know, even though we got some really you know outstanding uh, water renders there were times that we found it's like well you know if we go out into our element database or we actually go out and shoot stuff um, we will do that and, and we nice, we like to blend the two of those together because anytime you can bring something that is real into a shot like that it just helps sell it and there's other additional processing we can do it's it's a lot of uh, we do look a lot of reference photos uh, photos and stuff um, I know we we looked at stuff from like Niagara Falls because the, the stingers have water that's cascading off of them and these are big big battleship or bigger than battleship type uh, you know vehicles and, and so water falling from that distance is like what you would get coming off of a waterfall so as the the water comes down off the top it aerates and starts to blow and turns into mist and you do the transitions so in situations like that we would augment it with some uh, practical stuff we also would add uh, some heat ripple and shimmers like these things are alive you know that was kind of the plan they had a, a set of templates they kind of work out that uh, you know, for the, the various uh, movies they've used it for in the past. So they had to kind of set up some new ones, specifically like with the 16-inch guns, they had to look at reference footage of how, you know, the gun would fire. So we were looking at a lot of war uh, reference and war footage of, you know, these big, you know, I guess the Iowa-class battleships firing, what is the equivalent of a small Volkswagen Beetle 22 miles across the horizon. Um, and to get that dynamics, it, it took some time to work it out. And, you know, I think with anything, it's a matter of you need to have enough detail, enough complexity, and also a sense of scale. So, um, you know, with us having worked with a lot of practical elements over time, you know, we would um, sometimes even start a shot with a practical element and keep it in there throughout and maybe just, you know, use the plume in certain areas. Or sometimes with the big dest destruction, you know, shots we used, you know, plume almost extensively, you know, exclusively on that. You know, they had worked out some water tracking on the last Pirates movie, uh, which was a little tricky because, you know, it was on the water and it was stereo as well. Um, so what they had developed here was a, a better user interface to, to actually go in and put the points in there. You know, I don't profess to know the details of it myself. Uh, all I know is the result we got was incredible and uh, it, was, it was a lot faster than what we would have been able to do stuff in the past. Well luckily for us Battleship was not a, ended up being not a stereo show. I mean there was a discussion at one point in time early on. Always everybody says oh is it going to be stereo. Uh, you know having worked uh, compositing on Pirates there, there are certain difficulties you, you get into it, and, and I would say there are certain techniques or you know tricks that do not work in stereo. Uh, just especially if you're dealing with with water surfaces that are you know undulating and you're down at a low level uh, it's very hard to rebuild uh, one particular shot had to rebuild the the water surface and it was it was it was a nothing shot when you looked at it and you didn't even think about it but in order to do that it was some of the most difficult you know work I've had to do in a while just to reconstruct something because of the stereo aspect of it um, if it's if stereo is shot well, there's usually no big issue. I mean, of course, you have the typical stuff with highlights and specs. Sometimes uh, being in one channel and not the other eye, one eye, not not the other eye. But uh, you know, for the most part, um, the way we set it up in Nuke, we're we're just we run through essentially compositing just the left eye, uh, and if we have a problem, we can split out the right channel and do whatever correction we do and put it back together. So, as a compositor, you know, for the most part. You know, it doesn't seem like it really affects me a lot. It's just when you have to have a problem that you have to fix is where it becomes difficult.